Hey, good afternoon. Uh, today, in the first part of the lecture, uh, I'll discuss chapter 6, and then in the second part, chapter 7. Uh, and next week, I'll continue on topics related to uh, chapter 7, but going a bit beyond, and also next week, I'll um, this additional kind of the hints for, uh, for the project work and project work presentation. Uh, these chapters 6 and 7, they are kind of pair. Um, they are both uh, discussing also kind of the model checking and evaluating models, but the difference is that in the chapter 6, it is something that we can do already with just one model specifically. Chapter 7 is also when comparing models, but it's also some of these things which are discussed in chapter 6 can be used in addition of these like cross-validation things in chapter 7. Um, specifically now there's the, the the one thing is about the model checking is also that this kind of the, it brings sometimes this question that um, like the Bayesian theory says that we have prior information which should be information without what we know before we see the data. But then, uh, then we see the data and we use likelihood to update the prior and we get posterior. Now the chapter six discusses these things that how can we then check whether that model actually makes sense? And then there's the discussion also that uh, what if we now notice that actually the model doesn't make sense? And what if we now change the model or we change the prior? Is this any more Bayesian inference? Uh, this is a good question, and uh, the answer is that in, in the, those cases where these kind of discrepancies or model problems are big enough, um, we can kind of consider that the alternative would be to integrate over these different uncertainties, and if we, for example, integrate <coughs> or uncertainty whether we should use bad model or good model, it's likely that in this case we would get so small posture probability for the bad model <laughs> that if in the beginning we would have started with the bad and good model, we would end up anyway using the most of the posterior mass to the good model. So in that case it is fine that we do this kind of iterative process. We start with something and if we notice that it's bad, if we are replacing it with something that is good enough, it kind of approximates also the actual uh, valid Bayesian approach. Um, so overall, we can then check some Kind of the kind of the does the, uh, for example, posterior make sense considering additional information. Like for the in this bio example, what if the posterior would actually say that uh, this hazardous chemical decreases probability of death with increasing dosage? It might be that beforehand we did not think that we should include that constraint into the model. But it might be that afterwards we notice that, oh, there's not enough information in the data itself to include this constraint. Uh, there are other cases where we might have this kind of uh, additional information that we realize only afterwards when we look at the model and the results from the model that um, we realize we should have included. And of course, then if we know that it is really strong constraint that we, there's a lot of reason to believe that this chemical we are testing is really hazardous and it's not uh, actually some 
miracle cure uh, we just didn't know beforehand. Um, the usual way how science progresses is that um, people make observations and based on observations then make hypotheses and then it would be usually good then to compare um, the new theory to new observations. Um, and then if, we, if, if it's done this way, the new observations can be then um, kind of quite strong information about supporting some theory. Example of this kind of um, bit of idealized example is this predictions Einstein made um, considering relativity theory. He was able to of course, there were already um, some reasons to believe that maybe kind of the Newtonian mechanics is not all, but it was also much of the thinking that led to this kind of uh, prediction that light should bend when passing near big mass. And so the prediction was that, okay, light should bend also when passing near sun. And then there was that, okay, when we, get, when we could predict this would be when we have a solar eclipse. So we know quite well where the stars are and which are the angles between stars. And so uh, it is possible to predict that, okay, those stars which should are in the direction of sun, uh, the kind of the angle to them should change. Um, when the uh, line of path is going close to sun. And this was also then actually observed. And even if these initial observations were not even that accurate, but it was still kind of a um, big thing that, this, that something like this could be predicted beforehand and only then making the observations. It would have been less convincing if this observation would have already been there and especially if uh, Einstein would have been kind of fitting some arbitrary nonlinear model, E equals M, C, and alpha, and then trying to optimize what would be the value of alpha. Um, but also in those cases where we are using models, like in medical cases, we don't have these first principle equations like in relativity theory, uh, and we are learning parameters which would tell that, okay, this drug, with this, given this dosage, uh, it will improve the probability of staying alive next year with some person deeds. And these are estimated from the data, but then uh, the requirement would be, okay, does this replicate in a new case? Does they re replicate also for the new people? So this external validation is very important part that really actually wait for the new observations and check that your predictions um, are valid for the new observations. But then it's useful before getting these new observations already to kind of internal validation. If you think about these cases where we would make decisions on treatments uh, and if the only way would be by evaluating that way that, okay, let's just start treating and then wait for the new patients. If we already in internal validation could see that, okay, there's something wrong or it seems that this is not going to be effective. And then um, in chapter six, there's a lot of the, about the posture predictive checking and in a way now, um, chapter six doesn't discuss it, but it's also getting more popular to prior predictive checking, doing already validation, not just based on the data, but it is kind of connects now to the, the sensibility with respect to additional information part that we can also um, use the similar, similar things 
before getting even the first data set. And then there's a cross-validation part. So the chapter seven is more about cross-validation, but there's a kind of similar things we can do also with procedure predictive checking and cross-validation predictive checking, but also cross-validation can then be used uh, to estimate this kind of thing that, okay, leave part of the data out, and that's now our um, kind of the external parts, and then we can repeat this also many times. So we can simulate external validation using cross validation. Um, so the posture predictive checking is, so the name already says that we are looking at the posterior predictions. Um, the Newcomb's speed of light example is familiar for you from the book. And just using normal um, distribution molar to s explain the variation in the observations, and we would like to know then what's the uh, accuracy. But we can also then, so we form the posture distribution, and given the posture distribution, we can form the posture predictive distribution, and we can re sample from that predictive distribution. And now the notation is Y rep, is a replicate, and replicate referring that we are uh, drawing as many draws from the predictive distribution as the size of the original data. So we are kind of replicating the data by simulating from the model. And this we can do just uh, first drawing uh, one draw from the posterior distribution, and then using that uh, draw from the posterior distribution as parameters for the predictive distribution, and then draw replicate from that. And then uh, we can repeat this n times, and then we have n uh, observations, uh, simulated observations from the predictive distribution. And here's an example that how it could then look like that we obtained same amount of replicates from the predictive distribution as the original data and we can draw a histogram and then we can look, does this look similar to the original data? Um, now again a bit of about this notation. So uh, the Y rep is specifically when we re replicate kind of that whole experiment. What if would be simulated from this model? We use, use also um, <coughs> this Y tilde, which is uh, just something future, not yet observed, possible observation. It might be just one observation. But the y rep is specifically that what if we would get a similar data set uh, as, the, as the original in, in this size. Now we can then also generate several of these replicated data sets because just generating one, there's of course randomness there. But generating many times, we can then uh, kind of take into account the randomness and the simulation and then compare to the original data set. So here, there are nine data sets. One of them is the original data set, and others are now simulated using the model. Can you spot which one of the data sets is the original data set? At least in the those who are sitting, like the yes, correct. So they are kind of. It's also that in the number seven, you can see that in addition that it has two, like the lone uh, small bars, but then in addition the kind of the bulk part is more narrow. 
than for the others. And so in this case, we can see that, of course, there's a bit of variation in these different replicates, but all the replicates uh, are such that they are wider in the bulk, but they are missing that the further away um, observations. This is already one way to do this, but of course, uh, we can do also a bit better so that we can also quantify this. So this kind of visual inspection can also reveal sometimes things that might be a bit difficult to come up with good uh, these test quantities. But we can also, for each of these replicate data set, we can, for the replicate data set, compute some single value, and then we can also compute, for the original data, some single value, so instead of showing histograms, and then we can compare distribution of these test quantities for replications and for the original data. For example, if we compute now the test, test statistics uh, for the data, that minimum observation value, and also minimum for each replicated data set. And now in this case, there's a um, thousand different replications. So this also helps in that way that previously we had only eight replications but since there's some un uh, randomness when creating replicates, now making 1,000 different replicates and for all of them checking what's the minimum value, we know that then uh, there's less randomness involved when looking at is there something strange uh, compared with our model and the original data. And here we can see that the, the minimum value in original data is below minus 40. And in 1,000 replicated data sets, the minimum value, the minimum of minimum values is minus 20. So clearly, this model is now uh, that way different that simulating it from it's not presenting <coughs> as small values um, as the original data. And they, like the one term was this, this very small value was the outlier. Um, and we know that the Gaussian model doesn't have that thick long tails. And so maybe we should use then a model with longer tails that would have all of these um, rare smaller values. So in this case, it was we were able to see both in, in the um, looking at these different histograms or with this kind of test statistic, that yes, the Gaussian model is not able to explain the original data. When selecting, when doing this posture predictive checking, one um, kind of the worry is and what's kind of the common question is that, is this okay seeing that uh, we first use data to form the posterior, and we use the posterior predictive, then compare this posterior predictive distribution to data again. Aren't we using now data twice? Yes, we are. Um, but if we choose this test statistic so that it's ancillary or, or almost ancillary, where now this ancillary means that uh, depends only on um, observed data, and if its distribution is independent of the parameters of the model. Now our Gaussian model, it doesn't have specifically parameter for minimum value. It has parameters mean and variance. So we should choose a test statistics which is not which is as independent of mean and variance as possible. Of course, the minimum has also some dependence on mean and variance, but specifically bad test statistic here would be something which is very much correlating with mean or variance. And 
I can also show that if we choose the statistics variance, we can see that the variance of the original data and variance from the replicates, we don't see any problem. So in this case, it was truly a problem that we were using data twice, once to estimate the variance and another time checking that whether our estimated variance is close to data variance. So we, but we can come up with this kind of um, test statistics that are ancillary or at least somewhat ancillary. Quite common is also just to, um, instead of thinking about test statistics, is also this, I soon show you more example of um, looking at these predictive distributions. Uh, the book also discussed this posture predictive p-value. It's not that commonly used anymore, but I'll go through quickly um, the definition. So now you see here in the equation that we have these test statistics for replicates and test statistics for the data. And there's a probability that test statistic for the replicates is larger than test statistics for the data. And then it's just showing that, okay, this probability can be obtained by integrating over uh, posterior of theta and then the Y-rep distribution. And as examples of what that would mean here, the probability that Y-rep test statistics is larger than test statistic of the data, it's about one. And here, the probability that test statistics is larger than, so the statistic for replicates is larger than the statistics for data, it's maybe uh, 60 percentage, so 0 0.6. And then, um, and so we were able to just by making a lot of these replications, we, we can just count how many times the statistics of replicate is larger than the statistic for the data. And if it's almost always or always, then there's reason to concern. But if it's so that the replicate the statistics can be larger or smaller, um, kind of the with high probability on the both sides, then uh, we, that test aesthetic is, is doesn't show any problem. So it's kind of, we could say that, okay, it um, estimates whether the difference between the model and data could arise by chance. There's a bit of discussion in chapter six about the um, whether this is well calibrated because again of double use of data and what kind of how strictly we should think about the calibration of this. Uh, but it, you don't need to read that, uh, that carefully because it's not commonly used anymore even if it was recommended at that time. It's more common just to visually show this plots because then when showing the visually we get additional information where the problem is likely to be. There's also the, the since the book chapter discusses this, uh, that this posture predictive p-value is not calibrated because of the double use of data. There's also a possibility of then using cross-validation to partially avoid this double use of data. So I discuss cross-validation soon, but the idea is that we can um, look this, the model predictions and predictive distribution for that kind of uh, cases which were not included in the data set.
and then we get better, better calibrated results. I'll come back to this uh, after um, discussing more uh, cross-validation. There's just one example in a way for this that uh, um, what, did, what does this mean now that in the posture predictive checking we often are simulating like in this uh, light speed example the data set which has the same size while now we are looking at the one observation in, in case for um, the light speed example, there's not much difference because we don't have covariate X. There's more difference then, and why this is called the marginal predictive checking, kind of that it's not the joint. And this would affect, so I'll draw example. Um, actually, I'll, I'll come back to this also when, when I saw the cross validation figures about this, uh, probably the integral transform I have good figures there for that. Um, also then the chapter six has discussion on sensitivity analysis, so how much different choices in model structure and priors affect the results. So this is slightly different uh, in a way for the um, other checks that which are trying to find specific problem. But this is also um, in a way that we are using possibly the same kind of things. Either we are looking posteriors or we might looking at the predictive distributions and how much these change if, if we change our model structure or if we change prior. Um, I will give you example next week when I'm talking more about the um, example for the how, how to do this project work. Uh, instead now I, I focus on these, these model checking things uh, with few examples. You are already familiar with this exposure to air pollution, um, but in case this, there was some, uh, someone not um, present or someone watching the video uh, did not see the earlier videos. So there's this uh, air pollution and in this specific case the analysis was, was this particle matter measuring less than two and a half microns in diameter and it's known that this is linked to number of poor health outcomes and estimated um, responsible for three million deaths worldwide each year. Um, this has been now recently in use because uh, in Delhi, in India, uh, it's been now almost like 40 times larger um, concentration of these particles compared to what's the uh, WHO recommendation uh, for the be good air quality. Um, but in, o in order to then estimate actual these, these uh, health effects that how many uh, these deaths worldwide there are, we should know uh, of course this um, PM 2.5 measurements in different places but then we don't have uh, these um, air quality monitors everywhere and so this uh, shows with pluses, black uh, crosses these uh, locations of ground monitors but we would like to know also elsewhere uh, to have a better understanding of these effects worldwide and you can see that we are uh, missing a lot of measurements especially in Russia um, Africa, South America, and of course they are, like in Australia, it's no wonder there's no uh, ground monitors in the desert, so some places it, they are just unpopulated. 
and the uh, Australia uh, crosses are there where there are actually people living. So in addition, there's the high resolution satellite data of aerosol optical depth. And then the question is, can we, how well we can estimate these direct measurements, or the predicted direct measurements uh, from the satellite data. This one shows on x-axis the log satellite measurement and on y-axis the log a ground monitor estimate and we can see yes there's clear color correlation. Uh, the different colors corresponds to different regions and the question is that okay can we make a better calibration by using some model uh, for example, now, just looking at the data, it seems that uh, like the identity line, the, uh, the high-end observations are above the line, so it seems that there needs some need for calibration that uh, specific log satellite measurements correspond to actually a bit higher and ground monitor measurements. Also using hierarchical model, we can then kind of ask that, should we have a different calibration for different regions? And then um, the people who are working with this data have also made more elaborate models, including also elevation and uh, other things, which can explain more about these differences. Uh, I've discussed about the weekly informative priors beforehand, but this is another, I can repeat this example because it's a good example of adding, uh, or the, using additional external information. And can be used also already in the prior predictive phase, but of course also after getting posture predictions, we could use that external information also to check whether our results are sensible. And in a prior predictive phase, so this was with very vague prior, and then we can simulate, so draw from the prior parameter values, and using those parameter values, we then simulate from the predictive distribution, and we get some distribution for um, this uh, particle <coughs> concentration in air, and then we can add these uh, reference points. So density in neutron star, density of concrete, neither of those are breathable, so clearly uh, our prior predicted distribution is too wide. And Pallas Tunturifels is the cleanest uh, place in Earth, one of the cleanest places in the Earth and so we are also clearly uh, predicting to small values. And with weekly informative priors, uh, we get much more reasonable, at least it's less dense than concrete. We still have some posterior mass going below clean room um, qualifications, which is unlikely but this is much, much, much better already. When we are doing specifically this prior uh, predictive checking, there it's not a problem if we have some posterior mass going beyond some sensible limits. It would be more worrisome if we would be in a posterior predicting than that somewhere in Earth we are getting much cleaner air than in clean rooms or much denser than in concrete. Um, actually, the, we know that this, this is also still too wide. So now in Delhi, the measurement was um, at peak 900, so if it would be 1,000, and if we take log 10, it's just around three. So actually, in log 10 scale, we would be actually here in the, from Palastunturi to Delhi, just somewhere here. 
Um, in posterior, this is now the, the, like I mentioned that, okay, we can do these posterior predictive p-values or we can come up with test quantities, but this is the, what we recommend before even thinking any test quantity, just um, make a, some density estimate of the original data and density estimate of, of these uh, replicate data sets. Uh, it's in here, this is just the simple kernel density estimate, and it is useful to remember that sometimes these kernel density estimates can be also misleading. Sometimes it might be better to look at histograms or for the discrete data there are um, other things we can use. Uh, but here you can see that uh, example that we know that this we can consider this as a continuous data and then the kernel density estimate is already useful so that we can e see that the model one the predictive distributions are slightly different than the distribution of the whole data while we see that the model two is clearly improvement the difference between these was the model one is just uh, <coughs> non-hierarchical linear model, so just one calibration to all data, and the model two has hierarchical, so different regions have different, and it seems in a way that the, having this hierarchical model now can explain slightly different distribution in different regions, and it gets much better fit. But then when we are looking at this kind of kernel density estimate, it's also possible that it's a bit difficult to see what happens in tails. And oh, oh okay. <laughs> also notice here, so the black line is the original data, the general data the estimate for the original data. And then you can see there are thin lines uh, for model one, blue lines, model two, gray lines, but thin lines, so there's a general density estimate for each replicated data set. And then the kind of the variation in thin lines helps us to understand that, for example, around here there's this bump in the original data, and also in the top there's a bit of uncertainty. So it is also possible that even if we don't see those specific bumps in our replicated data sets, that it's just because of um, that kind of the by chance that these have these kind of shapes and plotting many kernel density estimates for many replicates helps us to see what would be the natural variation for these replicates. Um, but then, even with this, it might be sometimes difficult to see some properties. Uh, this is useful in a way that we can right away see in which way it is skewed or too narrow, too wide, and so on. But we could have also these um, test statistics. Here the test statistics is skewness, which is natural if we are using Gaussian linear model. Um, and then we can see now that model one is clearly <laughs> failing with this test statistic. Model two might be okay. And now it is actually in a way we Based on this, even if the true data skewness is now in the middle of the model three replicated data set skewnesses, and it's not in the middle for the model two replicated data set skewnesses, it, it doesn't say yet that model three would be then um, necessarily more true, <coughs> even if it um, able to model that that part much better. There's still possibility of this randomness and in a way the something which is on the edge but still in the region where we have the distribution of replicate skewnesses, it's, it's kind of fine. Um, but then we can also look at this uh, 
test statistics, we don't need to do it only for the whole data. We can do it also for these subregions, where we can also see that uh, the first one is clearly bad. Model 2, there's maybe the biggest difference is, is Southeast Asia, but on the other hand, Model 3 has also then a problem that Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, Central Asia is then also their um, bit off. So there's not, not yet clear that whether Model 2 or Model 3 would be then worse based on these test statistics. And I'll come back to this um, later to this slow, probably the integral transforms. A um, couple more examples illustrating what we can see from these um, uh, posture predictive plots. Here, uh, the data set was yield of mesquite bushes, so how much leaves uh, the bush uh, grows and when then kind of the harvesting it. And uh, there's a model for the weight. And you can see the first model that uh, the model has much wider distribution. But now you can also see the one case that it's actually predicting giving a lot of probability mass for negative weights. So this is also in addition revealing in addition of having that there's some discrepancy, but actually that discrepancy can be explained a lot that maybe we should actually not model the weight directly, but for example model the log weight so that we don't need to constrain um, just to positive values. We can also see that now one of these things with the kernel density estimator problems that also for the true data that the kernel density estimator is showing some density for negative values, even if the data doesn't have any negative values. But then if we make a model for log weight, we can see that now the model is performing much better. Um, another example, because th this is good for uh, binary data. Um, this is diabetes prediction with logistic regression. So the target value is diabetes or no diabetes. And then uh, with the binary data, the kernel density estimator is not directly useful. And what we can then do is uh, we can make it so that we make the predictions for each person, how likely they are um, going to get diabetes. We order the persons from the lowest probability of getting diabetes to highest probability of getting diabetes. Then we choose here, in this case, 10 percentage of those which have the lowest probability. And then we have 10 percent of those persons, and for those we can compute what is the actual observed even percentage, which is then this black dot, and then the bar is just binomial uh, model uncertainty. Because so in, a, in each 10 percentage group, uh, there's not that many persons and so we have some uncertainty, so it is natural that the observed even percentage is varying, and then it helps that we also plot these uncertainty intervals when we want to compare. Does it match that if we take the 10 percentage of the uh, uh, here, um, and then um, so it was not the 10 percent of the persons, but the predicted probabilities from 0 to 0 0.1. And for those persons, looking at the observed event probability, um, 
And, and this way we, we get this <coughs> calibration plot. Uh, and so for each midpoint, they should go approximately uh, along the diagonal. And, and in this case, it seems that this is reasonably well calibrated. Um, some people, I think this, this pin it, pinned version is fine. Some people would prefer uh, making nonlinear model fit to that calibration data. Um, it reduces the uncertainty because it's borrowing more information in a way here. Now these intervals are based assuming that these each pin is completely independent. But, and then this assumes that it would be smoothly changing. Uh, I had a bit of problems with this approach that then sometimes, especially in the edges, we get too, too strong effects based on what happened to be our nonlinear model. Um, so if you plot these, I would still recommend to plot also these. Um, and before the break, just the, the kind of that, how do we then uh, implement this in STAN? So we can generate from the predictive distribution in STAN generated quantities block. Uh, and here, this is for uh, data which had a Poisson count data. And in the model block, you can see that we have that y is distribution as, distributed as Poisson with parameter lambda. And then uh, in generated quantities, we can repl uh, get y replicate. And now n is going from 1 to capital N and then using Poisson random number generator to generate from the data. And in the end of the slide, there's just additional references. And then let's have a break. <clears throat>